Welcome again to Camp Hope Amy Church, located 114 Camp Hope Church Road, Macon, Georgia, 31211. My name is Reverend Dr. Michael L. Martin. I am here to be your Bible study guide. So where are we coming from? We are coming from Joshua chapter 5. And as we always say here at Camp Hope, come grow with us as we transform our thoughts, our words, and our deeds as we prepare for Christ's return. And we study to show ourselves approval. Workmen need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So as you get your Bibles out, let me go into prayer. Lord God, I just thank you. I praise you and glorify you for your truly worthy praise. Thank you for allowing us to be able to come to study. Lord, if we've done anything in thought, word, and deed that would hinder you for allowing the Holy Spirit to come, we ask forgiveness right now. Cover us in the sacrifice of your Son. And Lord, we'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. This is our prayer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And thank God. Joshua. Joshua chapter 5. And I will be reading from <coughs> the... Um, Amen from the NIV. Amen from the NIV uh, version. Again, Joshua, Joshua, uh, Joshua chapter 5. And it reads, Now when all the Am Amorite kings uh, was of west of the Jordan, and all the Canaanite king along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the, before the Israelites until they had crossed over. Their hearts melted in fear, and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flinch knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gib Gibbetha Haraloth. Now this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of the military of military age, died in the wilderness on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness during the journey from Israel had not. The Israelites had moved about in the wilderness 40 years until all the men who were of military age when they left Egypt had died since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land he had solemnly promised their ancestors to give up a land flowing with milk and honey. So he raised up their sons in their place, and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had now had not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in the camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgad to this day. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgad on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the product of the land, unleavened bread, and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. They were no longer, there was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the product of Canaan. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell down to the ground in reverence and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord army replied, take off your sandals, 
for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. I read to you Joshua chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. Let's get right into it. All right, in the beginning in verse 1, um, talks about the second work of Gilgad, Israel's radical obedience. Um, it says that when uh, the Jordan River had dried up, the people in, in, in Jericho, their hearts just stopped. It melted, and there was no spirit in them. The, the idea of a melted heart is a complete loss of strength and resistance. The Canaanites were stunned and terrified by the Israelites and the God who was with them. For the Canaanites, the event of uh, the preceding days, were it was a horror story to them. They had been terrified enough by seeing the Israelites' hordes, some two million strong, spread out along the eastern bank of the Jordan, it was obvious that the Jews intended to invade the Western land, but the waters was at flood stage, so they couldn't do it. The people could not cross because of the condition of the Jordan. There seemed to be time to get ready for them, but suddenly, suddenly the waters ceased flowing. The people crossed over and the battle was imminent. The... Uh, suddenness of the crossing of course terrified everyone now the miraculous passing through the Jordan was not only a, a testimony to Israel but it was also to the Canaanites it was an additional warning to them that God's judgment was on the way coming through the army of the Israelites Rahab had already reported to the Israelite spies that the Canaanites knew of and was terrified by the great things God had done already for Israel. The miraculous crossing of the Jordan added to their dread and, and that judgment was coming from the Lord, Yahweh, the covenant of God, the God of Israel. Verses 2 to 3 talks about the circumcision of the Israelites uh, at Gilgad. Uh, apparently, none of the sons during the uh, 40 years of waiting in the wilderness had been circumcised. There is no biblical record of circumcision being practiced during Exodus, and Exodus suggests it was a neglect practice among the Jewish people. This was put right, of course, at Gilgad. With an entire generation left uncircumcised in the wilderness years, virtually all the men of Israel needed to have their foreskins surgically removed with a flinch knife. Um, they didn't make a heel out of the foreskins, the place where the surgery was performed came to be known as the heel, of course, of foreskins. When God reaffirmed his covenant with Abraham, promising him the land of Canaan, he wanted him, uh, he warned him that anyone who was not circumcised would be violating the covenant. You can read this in Genesis chapter 17. Consequently, Israel could not claim the covenant land until the sign of the covenant had been restored, which, of course, was the circumcision of uh, the men. Verses 4 through 7 talks about the reason why so many men of Israel were uncircumcised. The men of the generation uh, that left Egypt had been circumcised, but that generation did not, of course, obey God. Remember, as we read that particular story, they did not obey the voice of God, and they failed to take by faith the promised land uh, flowing with milk and honey. Because of this failure to trust God, they died, of course, in the wilderness on the way. The generation of Joshua 5 took upon itself 
all the responsibilities of the covenant through the covenant sign of circumcision. Through circumcision, it could lay claim to the promise of the land that God had given to Abraham and to his descendants. In obedience to God's under both covenants, God made with Abraham and the nation of Israel, the sons of the new generation were circumcised, of course, at uh, Gilgad. Now, circumcision was not known unknown in the ancient world. It was a ritual practice among various people. Yet for the Israelites, circumcision was to every man a covenant, event sign of the covenant into which he had entered with God and of the mortal obligation under which he was thereby laid. Verse 8 talks about the faith um, demonstrated by Israel's obedience to the command to, of course, to the circumcision. Uh, the surgical procedure carried at this time and place made all the men of fighting age completely vulnerable and able to defend the nation for a period of several days. Scripture says, until their foreskin healed. Uh, Israel had camped for many months in the plains of, of the eastern side of the uh, Jordan River across from uh, Jericho. God had commanded this mass circumcision then when they were protected from the Canaanites by the barrier of the Jordan. Instead, what did God do? God waited until they had crossed the Jordan and were more vulnerable to the Canaanites to make their army uh, defenseless. In faith, of course, Israel did what? They obeyed. They trusted God to protect them when their fighting men couldn't. This faith would lead to the conquest, of course, of the Canaanites, of the Canaanites. God's only required this great trust from Israel after he showed his greatness by, of course, the Jordan River crossing. God required radical action of trusting obedience from his people, but he also gives them many and great reasons, of course, to trust him. Uh, verses 9 talks about God rolls away the Israel disgrace. Uh, this disgrace or reproach was the disgrace Israel carried from Egypt, the shame of their degrading slavery. Uh, the approach was rolled away by their radical trust, of course, of God, of obedience to God by taking the specific action God had told them to take. He, it could be said of the generation that died in the wilderness, they remind us of Egypt. The new generation was to have no connection. By their faith and obedience, they were a promised land people not a slave people. The people of God suited for his promised land, have been set free, of course, from Egypt, had left Egypt, know God is real and put him first, observed God's command and his rule. They accepted God's lordship. They make a true assessment of their present condition. They bring order and organization into their lives, receive and practice God's ordinance, trust in, in God's provision, trust God's provision through their hard work. They make memorables and memorials of the great things that God had done for them. They had lied. They lived their lives on the principles of, of faith. See, God worked in their day as in previous days, but not in exactly the same way. Take risks for God. Don't expect lives of ease and comfort. Deal with the sin in their midst. 
uh, conquered as they followed Joshua and are in a process, of course, of being patient as God does what God does. The name Gilgad here means rolling. When the Israel came into Canaan through the miracle of the dry riverbed of the Jordan and by the radical obedience at Gilgad, these mark the final steps in their transition from being a slave people in Egypt to being a free people suited for God's promised land. This completed a dramatic shift in their national identity. Uh, verses 10 through 11 talks about the Passover celebrated, looking back to their, of course, redemption from Egypt. Uh, God brought Israel through the Jordan and into the Canaan land on the day when Pentecost, excuse me, uh, Passover uh, preparations were to begin. Uh, now, as the 14th day of the month began at twilight, they celebrated their first Passover in the promised land. The Feast of Passover commemorated the great work of redemption God did for Israel in freeing them from their slavery in Egypt. There was a sense of completion in this Passover. They were no longer in the wilderness, but they were in the promised land. And uh, verse 12 was a new source of provision. God stopped the manna. When Israel was able to revive for themselves from the rich uh, produce of Canaan, God stopped the manna. He didn't want Israel to get lazy, but to live in the new partnership and trust with him. Israel had to trust God to bring the manna every day, but they also had to trust him to provide through other means. This Fulfill what God had said in Exodus 16. And the children of Israel ate manna 40 years until they came to an inherited land. They ate manna until they came to the borders of the land of Canaan. God always provides, but he is perfectly free to change the source of his provision as it pleases him. God's people should trust in him, not in his manner of provision. Gilgad was a mark by three important things. First, a memorial of the miraculous crossing of the Jordan. The radical faithful, faithful obedience of Israel in carrying out circumcision when vulnerable to the enemy. And the remembrance of God's work of redemption, of course, in their celebration of the Passover. Gilgad because, became a benchhead and camp for Israel in their conquest of Canaan. They returned to Gilgad after battle and remembered, finding strength in their remembrance of the memorial, of their obedience, and of their redemption. And finally, the last verses 13 through 15 talks about Joshua meets the commander of the army of the Lord. Joshua boldly approached this mysterious man with the drawn sword as a shepherd over God's people. Joshua had a responsibility to see if this armed man was a friend or, of course, a foe. Um, his sword drawn in his hand. This expression appeared in two other places, of course, in the Bible, with reference to the angel who stopped Balaam, which we will relieve later, and his donkey, and to the angel who stands ready to execute punishment for David consensus. And we're going to read that when we read First uh, Chronicles 21. A figure with a drawn sword is one not to be toyed with. He is one 
who threatens divine judgment. Um, of course, Joshua asks, are you for us or against us? Are you an enemy? Are you uh, uh, an advocate for us or are you uh, a foe? Are you for us or for our adversaries? This was a logical question asked of this uh, impressive man. The response of the man was curious, almost vague. No was, no was not a proper answer, of course, to Joshua's question. In a sense, the man refused to answer Joshua's question because it was not, of course, the right question. And it was not the most important question to be asked at that time. The question really wasn't if the Lord was on Joshua's side. The proper question was if Joshua and the people of Israel that he led were on the Lord's side. Joshua was a great military leader, having led Israel to battle over Amalek, yet he was a man of clearly higher rank, the commander, he said, in chief, in commander in chief of, the, of God's army. Joshua worshiped this remarkable man, falling on his face to the earth before him and submissively awaiting his command. Joshua's total submission to the commander shows that he knew this man was in fin fin infinitely greater of greater rank. This was also a virtual guarantee, of course, of the victory for Israel. If, if Israel obey, obediently carried out the orders of the commander of the army of the Lord, they would not lose. The point of the exchange seems to be that it was not for a Joshua to claim the allegiance of God for his cause. However, right it was, but rather for God to claim Joshua. The two would fight together. But Joshua would be following the commander of the army of the Lord in his cause and battle rather than it being the other way around. Next was, has been Joshua chapter 5. I ask you to read it over again. Amen. It's a great chapter. Amen. We ask that you would just pray. Let God open it up to you and see God as God moved and as God is faithful to God's people as, as we trust in the Lord, as we obey God in what God tells us to do. Well, thank you for tuning in to Camp Hope AME Church, located in 114 Camp Hope Church Road, Macon, Georgia, 31211. Remember, tomorrow night uh, at 6.30, we have the prayer line. Amen. We ask you to go out there with Deaconess Thomas and be in the prayer for the church, for yourselves, and any other prayer that you need. Amen. Also, we ask that you would tune in with us again, of course, on Sunday. Sunday school or church school would be at 9. Uh, church services would be at 10. And of course, tune again next Wednesday as we go to Joshua chapter 6. Again, as we say, come grow with us as we transform our thoughts, our words, and our deeds as we prepare for Christ's return. We thank each of you for tuning in with us. We thank you for your support. Amen. We thank you for you allowing God to use you to support us in all that we do. And we will always keep you in prayer. And as always, in and every every a broadcast, I will say this to you. God bless you, love you, and see you next time.